very good morning students so today we are going for another topic as this is about the respiratory organs in case of invertebrates and vertebrates so this is a very peculiar uh, mentioned topic in your syllabus that you have to give out the whole lots of the respiratory organs that are being used by different invertebrates and vertebrates for the respiratory processes so students in this particular lecture we'll be talking about the different kinds of organs that are present in different phyla and we'll be talking about their physiology that how they are working how they are getting up oxygen and how they are releasing the carbon dioxide so what is the mechanism of intake of air what is the mechanism of breathing in that particular animal and how it is taking in oxygen if it is water then what is the mechanism of taking dissolved oxygen from the water and uh, uh, what is the basic feature of that particular organ uh, that will be also discussed in this particular lecture so if we start with the the very primary slides so this is about the nature of the respiration so all the animals they must supply their cells with oxygen and get rid of the carbon dioxide that is produced inside the body so that is the basic basic function of the process of the respiration so every animal every organism that is requiring oxygen for its uh, the food oxidation for making energy inside the body so how the animals they take up oxygen and they get rid of the carbon dioxide so that is the mechanism or this is the nature or you can say this is a basic uh, fundamental you can say uh, the importance of the respiratory system now the physiological process by which an animal it exchanges the oxygen and the carbon dioxide with its environment is called as the respiration process so this is the whole basic definition of a respiration process that what is respiration so here you can uh, emphasize on one point that this is a physiological process that means it it is a, a functional process so in this particular process we exchange the carbon dioxide with oxygen so we are releasing carbon dioxide and we are taking oxygen now what is the basis of gas exchange now this is a very very important question as per uh, the physical exchange of gases is concerned now the respiration it depends upon the diffusion of the gaseous oxygen and the carbon dioxide down their concentration gradients now this is a very important point now when we talk about the physical exchange of the gases in between some surfaces of the animals we are taking one particular aspect into account that this is the concentration gradient aspect now what is concentration gradient this is the difference in the partial pressures of the gases so this is the difference of the partial pressures so if you have a uh, higher partial pressure of oxygen outside your body and if your body is uh, like capable of taking that oxygen through general body surface you will take it because it has got higher concentration towards outside and it has got lower concentration towards the inside of the body so that will diffuse in simply through general body surface so this is a very basic uh, you can say pattern of the gas exchange so whenever the physical exchange it occurs we take the concentration gradient into account now the gases they enter and leave the internal environment across a thin or rather moist layer now this is again a very important thing uh in many of the animals which are taking the dissolved oxygen from the water 
what they have they have got some respiratory surfaces now those respiratory surfaces should be kept moist they should not be dry so what they do is that on the respiratory surface there is always uh, they are putting some water drops on it so they are kept wet so what happens that water which is like pumped onto that organs it is containing the oxygen and the organ that takes down the oxygen from that particular water which is present on the respiratory surface so here i want to uh, emphasize on one point that the respiratory surfaces whenever they are dry they cannot take oxygen from the environment so this is a very very important point so they should be kept wet so respiratory surfaces they have a moist layer over them some animals they may secrete some slime layer over the respiratory surface they can uh, secrete some mucus layer over the respiratory surface and in some animals you will see in the coming slides that the respiratory organs they are present inside a cavity so that cavity is flushed with the water after some time so that we call it as the respiratory movements so those animals they flush away the water after some time so that is called as the replenishment of uh, oxygen or replenishment of water on to the respiratory surfaces so whenever the respiratory surface is moist it can take oxygen from that water now the dissolved gases the gases are present in the dissolved form in the water so that's why the dry respiratory surfaces cannot take oxygen now students there is a very basic concept of uh, the partial pressure as here it is men mentioned that 760 mmhg so this is uh, the atmospheric pressure that is seen through a mercury gauge now what is partial pressure then so partial pressure the concept if i have to demonstrate the concept of partial pressure suppose you have a, uh, you have an enclosed environment you are in a room and every gas it exerts its own pressure if you are inside a box and inside the box you have got many kinds of gases as in the atmosphere we have got many gases and every gas it's it is expelling or it is putting its own pressure so the pressure exerted onto a particular surface area by a particular gas is called as the partial pressure of that particular gas so if we are talking about like partial pressure of oxygen so this is the pressure exerted by only and only oxygen onto the walls of that particular you can say box or an organ so partial means some percentage so partial pressure is only of a gas so we can say partial pressure of oxygen is like 42 mmhg so that means that is the pressure of only and only oxygen if i talk about partial pressure of carbon dioxide so that will be the pressure exerted by the carbon dioxide only so we can have partial pressures of different gases but here in respiration we are only concerned with because these are the two major gases so we are only concerned with oxygen and carbon dioxide so of the total atmospheric pressure measured by the mercury barometer 760 mmhg oxygen contributes 21% that means 160 mmhg in the atmospheric pressure so this is the partial pressure of oxygen as per the percentage is uh, concerned it is 21% so that will be 160 mm hg 
Now, if uh, we are measuring by a barometer the pressure, so this is 760 mm, this is with the atmospheric pressure, this is for all the gases which are exerting pressure. Now, if we go with the oxygen, it contributes 21 percent. Now, the factors which affect the diffusion rates, these are very, very important uh, factors. You can take these factors into account in any of the questions. If you get any question on respiratory surfaces or respiratory mechanism or respiratory physiology, you can put these factors into account. So, that may fetch you some marks. So, the factors that increase the diffusion of the gases across a respiratory surface are like high partial pressure gradient of a gas across a respiratory surface. Now, if you have a respiratory surface, suppose you have like gills and uh, you have a partial pressure of 60 outside and 40 inside, that means there is a partial difference, there is a gradient of 20 mmHg. So, this is a good difference for diffusion of gases. Now, more is this difference, more can be the easy exchange of the gases. If this difference is like 40, so the gases can diffuse very easily. If it is like 50, again it is very easy. So, more the difference and uh, more can be the diffusion rates. Next is high surface to volume ratio. That means if you have a round kind of structure with the high surface area or you have a flat kind of a surface of respiratory uh, surface, then that can have a high surface area. So, as we have villi in our intestine to increase the surface area, so respiratory surfaces are also ramified into these kind of structures like villi. So, as you if you see the gills, it has got gill filaments. Now, why they are present? to increase the respiratory surface area. So, more you have the area, more can be the exchange. So, this is a very simple fact. High ventilation rates. So, this is the movement of the air or water across the respiratory surface. Now, suppose uh, I am taking example of like African elephant. So, African elephants, they have got large ears. So, when they fan their ears, what happens that with the counter mechanism of, or convection of the air, it increases. So, the blood cools down. So, they have got large surface areas of their ears and they have got high ventilation rate. So, as they move their ears faster, it can be like the more exchange of the air in the blood. So, more of the blood can be cooled down. So, that was another case, but in this respiratory case, I can give you an example of like replenishment rates. As we have discussed earlier that many of the animals, they are replenishing the water inside their gill cavities. So, this is the rate of ventilation that how uh, quickly they ventilate their respiratory surfaces. If they are putting water onto their respiratory surfaces, how quickly they put water onto it, how quickly they are replenishing the oxygen, how quickly they are replenishing their medium of the diffusion. So, this is the high ventilation rate. This is a good factor to increase the respiratory response. Now, we have got some respiratory proteins for the efficient uh, exchange of the gases. Now, if you take down some respiratory pigments, we will be taking this particular lecture uh, in the coming sessions uh, about the respiratory pigments, about their oxygen dissociation curves and what ab uh, about the physiology of these pigments. So, basically respiratory proteins are helping in the exchange of gases because these proteins can take up oxygen, they can bind oxygen temporarily 
and they are taking this gas to a particular target organ and then they can release that particular gas for those tissues. So this is the basic function of these respiratory proteins. So the respiratory proteins, they contain one or more metal ions that reversibly bind to oxygen atoms. That means, reversibly means it is a temporary fusion. So they can bind to a gas and they can release the gas. Now what are the factors of binding and releasing that will be taken in the later uh, lectures. So respiratory proteins, they have got some metal ions like if we have uh, hemoglobin, it has got iron. If we talk about hemerythrin, if we talk about hemocyanin, if we take about like talk about chlorocruorin. So these are all the proteins or the pigments which are having some metal ions. It can be copper, it can be iron. So these are reversibly binding to oxygen. So they can take oxygen and they can take carbon dioxide also. Now hemoglobin, if we are taking this particular pigment as this is a very uh, important pigment in case of vertebrates. So this is an RN containing respiratory protein which is found in vertebrate red blood cells. Now here I want to mention that some of the proteins they are present in the RBCs and some of the proteins they, they are present in the plasma. They are not present in the corpuscles. So they are freely, uh, they are dissolved and they are present in uh, the dissolved form in the plasma. But here in the hemoglobin it is present in the RBCs. So as we know that RBCs are enucleated, they do not have a nucleus. Now why they do not have a nucleus? Uh, there is a, uh, there can be one reason that to store more of the hemoglobin in the evolution, the RBCs have lost their nuclei. So this is, that can be one of the reason that why RBCs they lack nuclei. So to have more of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin has got iron as a metal ion. So this iron can bind oxygen uh, molecule. Now this is another respiratory protein which is present in our muscles. So that's why the name is myoglobin. Myo refers to muscles and globin is the protein. Uh, this is a respiratory protein which is found in the muscles of vertebrates and, and some invertebrates. Now here I want to mention that myoglobin has got a very good affinity towards the oxygen. Now if I compare both the proteins for oxygen carrying capacity, myoglobin is far much better than hemoglobin. So as our muscles they need more of the oxygen and they need oxygen in a very quick manner after some time very briskly because they are uh, working very hard. So myoglobin in evolution has changed itself and it is very very brisk kind of a protein which is taking oxygen to the muscles. So myoglobin is better than the hemoglobin as per the oxygen carrying capacity is concerned. So if uh, we take this particular chart, so here you can see uh, different pigments, the color, the site, the molecular weight, the oxygen volume percentage and the animal types in which these pigments are found. Now if we go with the first pigment, this is the hemocyanin, so I will not be taking this particular chart into account in this lecture, but that will be taken on later, uh, uh, on the later stages. So first is the hemocyanin, it is containing a copper ion, second is the hemerythrin, it is iron containing pigment, then we have the chlorocruorin, it is also iron containing. So this is a kind of misnomous name, chlorocruorin. Uh, because iron containing pigments they start with they start with the heme and if you take hemocyanin it is also a misnomous kind of a name as it is containing a 
Komparayan and the name is him, starting with him. Next we have the hemoglobin, so this is iron containing. So if you take these four pigments into account, only one is copper containing and other three are iron containing pigment. Where the chlorochlorine, it is of green color, hemocyan is, is it projects blue color. So the site is plasma, corpuscles, plasma, corpuscles respectively. So if you uh, go by molecular weights, if you can cram this, you can go with this. And uh, the animals found, you can go by the chart, wherever it is found. Okay, now, this is the main topic that we are starting with right now. So these are the organs present in the invertebrates for respiratory processes. So this is the part where we should emphasize more rather than we are discussing the physiology of respiration uh, in the first part of this lecture. So if we start with the invertebrate respiration, first comes the integumentary exchange. Now students, this is a very, very important aspect of invertebrates that invertebrates, they can exchange gases simply through the general body surface. So if we start with the very lower phyla, the protozoa, porifera, or you can go, go with cilantrita, then we go with the platyhelminthes, or you can go with ascalminthes, the flat worms, and then the round worms, even the, if we talk about ascaris, and uh, even with the earthworms. So all these animals, they have got a simple tendency to take the oxygen from the general body surface through diffusion. So some invertebrates that live in aquatic or damp environments, they have got no respiratory organs. So these animals, they are not having any kind of like gills or lophophores or like uh, book lungs or lungs, they don't have any special organs. So what they have is the general body surface. So how the exchange of the gases, it takes place through general body surface. So here I have written gases that diffuse across the skin. So that means if you have more of the partial pressure of oxygen outside the body and you have the lower partial pressure towards the inside. So there is a pressure gradient which can, which is helpful in the diffusion of the oxygen towards inside of the body. So uh, this is the simple mechanism of taking in the oxygen in these lower animals. So I'm not going to start with protozoa, then we talk about the porifera. So you can give examples, you can go phylum wise. And you, in the examination, you can quote these phyla and you can give the mechanism of respiration through integument, through the general body surface. But here I am not going for much details about these animals. You already know about all these animals. Okay, now, second part, these are the gills. Now, many invertebrates, they depend upon some specialized body surfaces for oxygen intake. So they cannot take oxygen through general body surface, but they require some modified kind of body surface. Now the gills, what are gills? Gills are actually the modification of a particular part of the skin. So by the time of evolution, in, in, in evolution, they have evolved different types of gills on their bodies. Some gills are present on joints. Some gills are present on their appendages. Some gills are present in the cavities. Some gills are present outside the body, external gills. So the gills are of different structure are of different, uh, you can say, uh, sizes, but the physiology of 
the respiration in gills is the same for all the animals. So, what are gills? So, these are the filamentous respiratory organs that increase the surface area for gas exchange. That means the gills are modifications, they are the modified surfaces which can increase the respiratory surface area. So, this is the basic, basic function of the gills to increase the respiratory surface area. So, if you see, uh, we will be seeing the uh, the structure of the gills in the later slides uh, and if you see the structure of the gills, the gills are formed of different or you can say uh, high number of gill filaments. So, these filaments they have a great surface area and they have got high surface area to volume ratio. So, why it is so to take more of the oxygen and to give more of the carbon dioxide in less of the time. So, what is the efficiency? The efficiency is that how, how much is the time taken to take up and release a particular amount of gas. This is, this can be the efficiency of a respiratory surface area that can be of the gill also. So, if you have like a, 1 kg of gas present outside the gill or 1 liter of volume. So, that has to be taken in. So, what will be the efficiency that in how much time that particular amount of gas will be taken in. So, this is efficiency. If one gill is taking in 1 minute and second gill is taking this particular amount of gas in 2 minutes. So, who is efficient? The first gill. So, the first gill will be, it is efficient than the second gill because it is take, taking less time. And uh, the second thing which we have to take uh, into consideration is the release of the carbon dioxide. So, if the gill number 1 is releasing the carbon dioxide on the same rate, that is a good gill, that is an efficient gill. So, uh, the exchange of gases, the rate of exchange of gases, it depends upon the surface area of a particular gill. So, gills are the modifications which can increase that particular respiratory surface area. So, third thing which is present in the invertebrates for respiration are the lungs. So, we have lungs, in mammals we have got lungs, but in invertebrates, lungs are also present. So, these are sac like respiratory organs with branching tubes that deliver air to the respiratory surface. Now, tubes may be lacking also, here we have written branching tubes. So, these are the peculiar or you can say the particular structure of the lungs inside our cells in the humans or vertebrates you can say. But the lungs of uh, invertebrates they may lack these tubes or trachea. Just in the case of, if you take the case of apple snail or the pila, so it has got a single lung. So, here it is called as the pulmonary sac. So, this pulmonary sac is present along with the gills for respiration. So, whenever the snail is inside the water, it is taking the help of gills to respire because it has to take oxygen from the water. Now, if this snail is in the air, now it is taking the help of the lung to respire. So, this particular animal, the pila, it has got both the gills and the lung, though the lung is single in number, it is one. So, it is a bag like structure, it is a sac like structure and uh, this bag, the wall of the bag is the respiratory surface. So, if you see it uh, like uh, in a modification way, this is again a modification of the body surface. Now, what is lung? This is a kind of invagination which is present inside the body, which is a bag like structure, a sac like structure. Uh, it is just a, you can say, invagination, that is a modification. 
of the general body surface. Now there, uh, in these kind of animals where lungs have developed, the skin is not permeable to oxygen or gases. Now they cannot take oxygen through general body surface, but they have modified some part of that surface into lungs. So the lung surface is respiratory, that is the very same thing. So this is the basic, uh, you can say, mechanism of exchange of gases. Now students, now we are taking first diagram of the prone. So this is an arthropod and you all know that in prone we have uh, a particular cephalothorax. So students, this is the part which is called as the cephalothorax. So cephalo, this is the head part. This is the head part. So this is the thorax part. So if we like consider whole of this part, if we take head plus thorax, this is called as cephalothorax. So this cephalothorax has a particular, uh, you can say, exoskeleton over it, which is called as carapace. So you should write on your copies, carapace, C-A-R-A-P-A-C-E, carapace. So carapace is the outer exoskeleton of cephalothorax. Now this carapace has got an empty space, a cavity inside it. So this cavity is called as the gill cavity. So here you can very well see these are the gills present and these are enclosed in this cavity. And whenever the prone it moves or it uh, moves the appendages, this cavity, the water inside that cavity is replenished. So that is a respiratory process. The replenishment is a respiratory process. So it replenishes its water or you can say the oxygen containing water after some time. So this water enters into this particular cavity and the gills, they take up the oxygen. So this is a mechanism of respiration in prone. Now if we go further after prone, so you, here you can see the crab gills. So this is a crab and you can see again the respiratory cavities. So this is the respiratory cavity in which a gill is present. So here we have mentioned the gill cavity. So this is a TS of the body. So here you can see the gill cavity and in which you have got the comma like. This is a gill. So inside the cavity we have the gill. So after some time there is a replenishing process which we, we have discussed earlier also. So these gills are taking in oxygen. Now if we go further, now here you can see this is a podobranch. So this is a very very important slide as per your, uh, uh, the structures are concerned. So here you can see this is the proximal part of a periopod of an arthropod. So this is an appendage and here you can see an exopod, exo is towards the outside. So if you see the epipod, it has got a podobranch, podobranch, podo refers to the feet, podo is the appendage which is helping in like uh, walking or swimming. So podobranch, this is the branch, branch is the gill. So podobranch is, is the gill which is present on the epipod or the, uh, the feet, podobranch. So we have the arthrobranch, if you can see. So here we can see the arthrobranch. Arthro means the joint. Arthro, it is the joint. Branch is the gill. 
so this gill is present on the joints and next we have the pleurobranch so pleuro is towards the pleuron this is the body so it is a gill which is present on the body of the animal so these are the three types of branchs which can be present over the body of these arthropods so here we are talking about like uh, the phylum arthropoda now we have the another example of snails as we have discussed earlier the uh, lung of the pila so if we take into account the snails so they have got the lung so snails and slugs that spend some of the time on the land they have lung instead of the gills in addition so that means the snails and slugs as they are amphibious in nature they can be found in water they can be in the air for some time so if they are in water they take the help of gills if they are in air they take the help of lungs so this is a particular diagram in which you can see the lung and the gill in the case of pila so students if you see the diagram carefully you can see this particular part this is the pulmonary sac pulmonary sac refers to the gill and if you see the lining on the right side this is the gill so what happens the water it enters the body of the pila through the nostril lobe and when it enters it first of all it is going for a particular organ which is called as epitenia so here you can very well see the epitenia so this is the wall uh, over which the water has to go then it can reach the gills so if epitenia is low then the water will enter the gill cavity and it will reach the gills if the snail is in water the epitenia is in the up position so then the air enters the nostril lobe and this air is going for the pulmonary sac so it will reach the lung then so it is both having the gills and the lungs so this is a very important uh, aspect of snails so these are the two important things now something about uh, the invertebrate respiration in case of insects now this is a tracheal system now this is a very very important kind of system uh, on which you can uh, get a particular question also so if we go by the tracheal system the insects they are having a hard integument having the branches now students these are present inside like many of the insects like if you take the example of cockroach if you take the insect uh, the cricket or you can take any of the insects so tracheal system is the basic system which is helping in the respiratory process now this tracheal system is very much similar to a vertebrate kind of tracheal system as you have different tubes inside this system so the insects with a hard integument or the exoskeleton they have branching tracheal tubes that open to the surface through spiracles so this is a very important line so if we take the example of a cockroach it has got numerous spiracles on the lateral side of the body so some spiracles can be thoracic and other are like abdominal spiracles so these spiracles the these are the openings of the trachea inside the body so air has to travel through these spiracles then it can reach the tube now the spiracles they can be of two types number 1 they are permanently open so spiracles these are the holes through which the air is entering into the tubes of the tracheal system so spiracles they are permanently open in some insects and in some insects they may be they may be closed so this is the second type so 
these tracheal systems they help in the respiratory process now just see how next before taking the tracheal system i am taking other book lungs so this is another kind of structure which are present in different invertebrates so here some spiders they have thin sheets of respiratory tissue that exchange oxygen with the respiratory pigment with the help of that pigment in the blood so students as the name suggests this is a book lung book refers to uh, a structure which has got like pages these are very thin kind of the respiratory surfaces so it has got thin sheets of respiratory tissue which is uh, which is capable of taking oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide so it has got profuse blood supply because that respiratory surface has to take in oxygen and give it to the blood for transport so this is a case in spiders now students this is a particular structure of the tracheal system in case of insects now if you see this particular upper diagram here you can see the spiracles these are the tubes and the this tube is opening on to the surface like here it is opening on to the surface this is another spiracle this is another spiracle so these are the openings where these tubes are opening outside the body now this spiracle if we go inside the spiracle what is present these are the trachea so these tubes these are the tracheal tubes so if you see in the thorax part if you see this part it has got thick tracheal tubes so these are the thick trachea <clears throat> so if you go this will ramify to form thin tubules so after ramification so the tubes become thin so as you can see in the very central part these are the thin tubes they even further ramify to make more of the thinner tubes so in the head part in the neck part in the thorax part you have the thicker or the thick trachea in the lower abdomen part you have the thin trachea so you can take this particular diagram from any of the book so here you can see a particular uh, diagram if you see this particular diagram here you can very well see the presence of the rings on the trachea now these are the chitinous rings present over the tracheal membrane which is uh, like keeping them open so they make the trachea stiff to some extent and thus the these trachea they do not collapse and they are present open all the time so they can take more of the gases so this is the particular function of these chitinous rings so if you take uh, a tube like structure out of the body of an insect and you keep it under the microscope and if you are seeing these rings so that means it is the trachea if rings are absent this is not trachea then that is some other part that you have taken out so students that was the trachea so this is another example of the trachea if you see the opening if you th see this part this is the spiracle part where it opens outside and if you particularly see the inside of the spiracle so here you can see a particular structure which is a kind of valve so this is called as the tracheal valve so this trachea or spiracle you can say this can be closed 
with the help of this valve. So this is the second type of spiral, uh, the spiracle, which we have talked later that some spiracles are permanently open and some may be closed. So this is a spiracle which can be closed with the help of the valve. Now when the oxygen it enters into the spiracle, if the valve is open, it travels down into the trachea. It can go on to this side, it can go on to this side, it can travel further, it can ramify into the tracheal tubes. So these are the fine tubes which are called as tracheoles. So it is the oxygen is going into tracheoles. And the last part of the tracheoles, if we go by this part of the tracheole, these are filled with the fluid. So you can call it as the tracheal fluid. So here the oxygen, it mixes with this fluid. So if we concentrate on this part, here the oxygen, it will dissolve in that tracheal fluid. And these cells which are present uh, here, which are shown here in the pink color, they are taking the oxygen from that particular fluid in the dissolved form. So this is a very, very important uh, thing to note. So the tissue is taking up oxygen in the dissolved form in the, from the tracheal tissue or the tracheal fluid. And the carbon dioxide, it is going out on the same path. So it is going into first of all the fluid, the tracheal fluid, then it is released into tracheoles, then go to the basic trachea, then it is going out of the body through the spiracle. Now the bodily movements, the movements of the body of the insect, it helps in this particular exchange in the intake of oxygen and outtake of the carbon dioxide. So when the body moves, the tracheal tubes, they are pushed and pulled and they are dampened and they are uh, like compressed to some extent and which helps in the exchange of the gases. So this is the mechanism of the exchange of the gases in the insects. If we go further, now we have the example of the spiders. Now spider has got a book lung. And this is a particular slide which is showing the structure of a particular book lung. Now if you see the, first of all the placement of this book lung, it is on the ventral side of the spider. So it is present near to the, like uh, this is a point of uh, the contact of the thorax and the abdomen. So it is present on the lower side of the starting of the abdomen. So this is the respiratory surface. So if you see uh, the uh, scanning electron micrograph of this particular book lung, so you can very well see these are the sheets. These are the thin sheets of the book lung and these are the air filled spaces as we have written in the labeling. So this is the blood filled space. So here we have the hemolymph. So I am trying to make it very clear. In this particular cavity we have the hemolymph. Here we have got the air. Again we have the hemolymph. Again here we have the air. So there is a mechanism which is called as a counter current mechanism of air flow which is present in the book lungs. So here the flow of the air is in the opposite direction to the flow of the hemolymph. So that helps in the exchange of the gas from the air into the hemolymph. So this is a mechanism that how a book lung is taking up the oxygen and releasing the carbon dioxide. So in the next diagram we will see that is a diagrammatic representation of a book lung and here you can very well see that air is entering from the lower side. So it is going into 
these lamellae, the you can say the interlamellar air spaces. So, these are the air spaces, the white colored spaces, and in the dotted spaces, we have got the hemolymph. So, here it is written as blood. So, what happens that the exchange occurs at this particular level. So, this is the exchange area. So, as you can see, we have got the interlamellar air spaces and we have the lamellae with the blood or lamellae with the hemolymph. So, these lamellae they help to increase the surface area as we have discussed earlier that respiratory surfaces they should have good respiratory surface area. So, in the book lungs we have got huge respiratory surface areas that is why they are books and these lamellae they are they can be compared with the pages of a book. So, that is why we get the name book lung. So, students that was the case of the spiders. Now, if we go with the next structure of respiration, these are the lophophores. So, these are a very characteristic feature of the bryozoans. So, if we take any bryozone, then these lophophores can be present as the respiratory organs. Now, the phylogenetic evidence, it indicates that lophophores, they evolved once then more. So, what happens that lophophores, they are some protruding structures, the tentacle like structures. If you go with the, uh, the structure, we will be taking on in the later slides. So, lophophores, they have a crown of ciliated tentacles that are used to capture food and respiration. So, these are the two functions of the lophophores. First is to capture the food as we have seen in the sealant traits. They also use their tentacles to capture the food as they have got the sting cells or the stinging cells nematophores. And here we also have the same functions. And the second function that we are concerned about is the respiration. So, the cavity inside the lophophore is a part of the coelom and filled with the coelomic fluid. So, what happens that lophophore, the, the tentacle of a lophophore, it can take out the, the oxygen from the environment, from the water and they can diffuse the oxygen into the coelomic fluid. So, oxygen will be taken in, it will be taken in the coelomic fluid and coelomic fluid, it can reach the whole body parts. The ciliated walls, they act as the respiratory surface of the gas exchange. That means, the ciliate, ciliated walls, that simply means they have to increase the surface area. Now, lophophores, they normally extended, they are normally extended, but they can be withdrawn for protection also. So, in the coming slides, I will be showing you the extension and the retraction of these lophophores. If you see this particular bra zone, this is a general bryozoan and uh, it is a freshwater bryozoan, it is living in freshwater and you can here very clearly see a lophophore. So, this is an extended lophophore with the tentacle like structures for respiration and capturing of food. So, here we are talking about respiration. In this particular structure or diagram, you can see uh, the retraction of these lophophores. So, in the very first diagram, lophophore is protracted. Protraction means coming out of the lophophore. So, here it is out of the zeusium. So, in the second diagram, it is being retracted back into the body and in the third stage, it is the retracted lophophore. That means, it is present inside the body now. So, this particular animal has got retraction and protraction muscles also. So, in the very last diagram on the C part where we have retracted the lophophore, you can see the retractor muscle. So, it pulls down the lophophore. So, it has got protractor muscles also which is protracting this lophophore outside the body. Now, students after lophophores, we have got a special 
respiratory tree in echinoderms. So this is uh, another respiratory surface or the organ which is used for respiration in echinoderms. Now if we take this example of sea cucumber, the water is drawn through the anus. Now this is a very very important point to note. The water is taken in through the anus to a pair of branch tubes called the respiratory trees. So, in the diagram you can very well see these are the two respiratory trees and they are joined to the cloaca. So, what happens that water is taken in through this cloacal part and it goes to the respiratory trees. Now, the respiratory trees they are the extensions of the gut and they are suspended in the body cavity and they are surrounded by the salomic fluid allowing considerable gas exchange. So that means first of all the air is drawn into the anus or the cloacal part and then it goes to the whitish respiratory trees on both the sides. Now these trees from the respiratory trees the oxygen can diffuse in the salomic fluid. So simply this is the mechanism, so if you go by this particular diagram, if I have to show you, first of all the air it goes into the coelom, then it goes to the respiratory trees on both the sides, when it goes into the respiratory trees, the oxygen can diffuse into the coelomic fluid. So it comes out of the respiratory tree. So this is a kind of taking in of oxygen. So if you like uh, go back, if carbon dioxide is present in the silomic fluid, it will be taken into the respiratory tree and it will be going out. Then the water when it is thrown out of the cloaca the oxygen it goes out simply through this water. So this is the kind of mechanism of respiration in case of echinoderms. So the organs you can write them as respiratory trees. So students we have a last part of respiratory organs that is in starfishes. So in starfish we have got the respiratory tube feet and they are made up of very thin tissue. So you may have noted the presence of the tube feet in case of starfishes and uh, the gases they can move through easily the tube feet. Now their tube feet and the papulae these are the second respiratory organs in case of uh, the starfish or the astrias. So the first are the tube feet second are the papulae. Now these are the thin pimple like structures over the body of the echinoderm. So as the starfish it is uh, in the phylum echinodermata. So echinodermata literally means the presence of echinos. Echinos are the thin needle like structures or you can say outgrowth of the body surface. So echinodermata, dermata means skin, echino, echinos means uh, some bristle like structures. So papulae they are the outgrowth of the body surface but they are not like sharp, they are blunt. So in the coming slide we will be taking the structure of the papulae. So these are also the respiratory body surface. So if you see this particular diagram this shows a single papula. So it is also showing the direction of the flow of the salomic fluid. So here you can very well see the salomic fluid is entering into the cavity of the papula and it is coming out also. So inside the body of the papula here you can very well see this is the salomic current. So the salomic fluid it moves inside 
the body of the papula in the shape of O. So, when it is moving, it is taking in the oxygen simply through diffusion. So, the oxygen now it mixes with the salomic fluid and this salomic fluid will take the oxygen into the body cavity. So, this is a kind of uh, exchange of the gases through the papulae and simply for carbon dioxide the process is a uh, very same, but it is in the reverse direction. So, students uh, that was all about the respiratory organs which are present in uh, the invertebrates. So, in this particular lecture we had talked about the organs, the organ types, the mechanisms of respiration and the functions or you can say the physiology of the respiratory organs. So, I wish and I hope that you have understood this particular topic as this is a very, very important topic as for your syllabus. Thank you.